Hi guys, welcome to a video called I'm watching a video called Game Theory Who is WD Gaster by the Game Theorist. I I've never watched the WD Gaster. I watched the Sands Exposed, but anyway. Let's continue. Oh wait, I need to put up the volume. <laughs> I'm going to put it like up to like 20. There we go, 25. Okay, it's a little too loud. 20 is big enough. 20 is left. So. Yes, they are. The number scale from A, from visual design to actual sound effects to even the timelines of the game. And the overwhelming way to be able to show that that video competition. Don't get me wrong, I have gotten used to dealing with internet people for these days. I've gotten through the times of world controversy. I had literal petitions written to remove me from the internet for slandering Mario's mission by calling him a sociopath, but this one, this one, but it was nothing compared to the next time I talked about on the channel. When I was selected for the honor of leading Pope Francis as one of the first 10 digital creators to introduce him to the world of online video, and as part of that, we were expected to give him a gift. So I gave him a copy of Undertale and then made a video talking about that. One, because it was such a huge honor for me, but two, because I was excited to share it with you. This was our achievement as a tourist community, as, as gamers, as online digital creators, and people who love online things. And the hate that that video received in the first week. I mean, this was a video where I specifically talk about accepting others and saying no to hating other groups of people, and it got hate. That's on the internet for the past month. Now, I tend to stay quiet in situations like that. <sighs> Don't cyberbully, kids. Don't cyberbully. Cyberbully is basically when you comment on somebody's video, like, sometimes. It's like... You comment on somebody's video and you're like, I hate this video! And then say a bunch of mean stuff afterwards, like cuss words and all that stuff. That's sort of like cyberbullying. That's one form of cyberbullying that I know of. I think I've learned that fighting back only seems to make it probably worse. But since I'm talking about Undertale and since I know all of those comments are going to come flooding back in this video, I figured let me address some of the misconceptions and errors that were leveled against me when I first made that video. One, I talked to the Pope about cyberbullying in school. I did not, as many people wrongfully accused me of, waste his time talking to him about video games or gamer problems. In fact, my entire conversation with the Pope is available on YouTube right now. If you had actually taken a couple minutes to do research before assuming and accusing me of things, it would have actually saved me a lot of sleepless nights. Two, the gift of a game was symbolic. Of course the Pope isn't going to play a video game, but three, if you thought that the gift of a video game was bad and had problems with that one, at least it was better than a surfboard, an illegal tree, and a YouTuber's self-written book about themselves. All oh, things that the Pope also received as gifts. Oh, oh, oh. Make another video, huh? 
I feel bad for Matt Pat. Hi, Ma. Uh, mm -hmm. 
supported by evidence, so let's start gathering evidence. Now, whether or not the gray NPCs show up is based on a weird stat program that slowly called the Fun Map. Basically, whenever you start a new game on the hill, you can get a number between 1 and 100. Depending on what number you get, different things happen in the game. Keeps things spicy. Also, keeps things really similar to Snap when you come to think about it. Seriously, are you sure PC fan bases really hate each other? Because no joke, between wacky animal hijinks, hidden plot mysteries, random Easter eggs, and large quantities of murdered children. Your franchises are a lot more similar than I think people want to admit. Anyway, these gray NPCs show up with a fun value of that 61, 62, 63, or higher than 90. And even if the number is there, they only have a 20% chance of showing up per game, which is why your chances of ever even seeing them is so low. Even creepier, if you have a fun value of 66, this eerie gray door appears in Waterfall. When you walk through it, there's a chance that the mystery man appears. You touch him, and poof, he pieces out faster than a babysitter's boyfriend with a parent couple. And the fun value dictates takes more than just gaster encounters in secret rooms. When you played Undertale, did you get a call from Sam about your refrigerator running? Or maybe someone called you with a wrong number and then you got a really random song out of it. Or Alfie's call to order some pizza. Well, all of those situations were dictated by your fun value. So why spend all this time talking about fun? Well, because it's the start of the mystery. If there's one thing we know is that in the world of Undertale, game mechanics aren't just game mechanics. Toby Fox makes it clear throughout the game that game mechanics make up the very fabric of the game's right, reality. Right, this aren't right. just artificial right. invisible layers on top of the right. story for players to use when right. interacting with the game. These rules for saving, for loading, and everything in between all encompass the actual physical laws of Undertale's universe. Much like quantum mechanics and general relativity define art. Character stats like LDLs or levels of violence and EXP or execution points in any other game would be numbers relevant only to the player. But in Undertale, there are real tangible values that characters, most notably Sam, can sense and judge. So if fun is what dictates the appearance or non-appearance of a bunch of these characters connected to Gaster, well, then it behooves us to figure out what fun actually is in the context of the game. And if you're under the mistaken impression that fun is a sense of childless glee that also comes with playing games that you are wrong. You're just wrong. <laughs> the fun value with Undertale is the embodiment of the very real theories and quantum mechanics known as the many worlds interpretation. It's a favorite of mine here on Game Theory, applicable to everything from the Zelda timeline to the Pokemon universe. So since I've covered it a few times, I'm not going to go in depth here. Click the eye icon in the upper right hand corner to check out those videos where I spent a bit more time explaining it. Long story short, the many worlds interpretation involves the measurement of photons and wave particle duality, but in a nutshell, imagine you're starting a new game of Undertale. You have the option of either going through pacifist or genocide. Now, in that moment, according to the laws of quantum mechanics, it doesn't matter which you choose. If you choose a pacifist one, there's an alternate reality where you went full-on homicidal maniac. And vice versa. All possible realities simultaneously exist. Each time you're presented with an option to either kill or show mercy to a new character, two new timelines are created. One for each option. And this is where we get back to Gaster and his followers. You see, if you find him, Garner Kid speaks the following line. Have you ever thought about a world where everything is exactly the same, except you don't exist? Well, in my first playthrough of the game, that's exactly what happened. A world where he didn't exist. In fact, I must have gotten a really lame fun value since I didn't find anyone mentioning Gaster. No secret rooms. No one even wanted to call me. Truly, I was forever alone. But there are realities where he does exist, and where Sam does pick up the phone to call you. In short, think of each new fun value as another world in the many world interpretation. Another timeline. Parallel realities where one small detail is different. Gawker Kid does or does not exist. Alfie does or does not order pizza. So the next time someone tells you to go outside and have some fun, all you really gotta do is create an alternate reality in your own backyard. That. But not only does this fun value make repeated playthroughs of the game interesting, but it makes a world, pun intended, of difference when it comes to Gaster's storyline. From speaking to the Gaster followers, we know that an experiment went wrong and Gaster was shattered across time and space. Those are some pretty specific words. First, shattered, as in... Yeah. That is very specific. Oh my god, I don't know how to explain. of him was in many different directions. There are multiple pieces of Gaster that now exist. And then there are the operative words of time and space. Meaning that these pieces ended up across many different timelines. The many different worlds, each represented by a different fun value. 
But what other characters do we know are able to retain memories across multiple different timelines? Only two, Slowly and Sam. Slowly tells us at the end of the genocide run that he's lived hundreds, if not thousands of times, doing everything under the sun from being nice to people to torturing them. And in the true worst of this run, as real, Slowly's true identity makes mention of being able to destroy this timeline once and for all. As real even says the following lines, at the hour you die, your friends forgive you a little more. Your life will end here in a world where no one remembers you. It's a really specific thing for Asriel to know, that killing something over and over again will cause the memories of it to fade in everyone's mind. In fact, we may even know someone who he's done this to. Garner, yeah, Asriel's speech during the final battle is a direct parallel to the same lines we just saw Garner give Steve a few minutes ago. A world where he no longer exists. The thought terrifies him, almost as though Asriel did this to him to the point where he does no longer exist. Sans, on the other hand, isn't as powerful as Flowey from a time manipulation perspective, but he does bend the laws of space around him, phasing through walls, and during his battle, continually teleports over and over and over again. Though he doesn't show the ability to save or reload like Flowey does, he openly acknowledges that there are other Sanses out there in other realities that come to the same hello to them. He has tests in place to see if someone is a time trail. And even though he can't outright control time, he has at least some deeper understanding of timelines being manipulated, as evidenced by his various dialogue options when you fight him over and over during the final genocide battle, sensing how many times he's beaten you. So is it any wonder that the two characters who together Ew. manipulate time and space both wield weapons that look like this? And that, at least for Sam, this weapon, according to the strike files, is to be called a gaster blaster. Or that for Flowey, this is the weapon that he specifically calls yeah. out will destroy the timeline. In fact, as you can imagine, there's a lot more to say about the Sans Flowey Gaster connection. But before we do, let's quickly recap. Gaster, the man who speaks in hands in the Royal Scientist before Elfies, is an entity only known about through his four followers, ones that only appear in certain timelines of the game. These timelines are ultimately dictated by a random fun value. With him being shattered across time and space, he must share some connection with the other two characters that seemingly straddle time and space, Flowey and Sans, and indeed he does in the form of his Gaster Blaster. But there's more. So much more. From the determination experiments to information found in the Drew Lab, to Toby Fox's Twitter, to the pivotal clue that makes sense of all of this, the word search. No joke. But that's for next time when we hop into deep war talk, neuroscientific analysis, and much more to finally reveal the truth behind WD Gaster. So make sure you ring the subscription bell for the new Alright guys, that was the end of this video. We're probably gonna watch part two of it. Anyway. Anyway. Anyway, what's good? Anyway, goodbye. It was a good video.